there. Uh, this year's Virgin Media Dublin International Film Festival is going to be very different from previous years. Uh, still some wonderful films, some fantastic guests from around the world. But this year we won't be together in a cinema. It's going to be 100% online. And so we asked a great, great friend of the festival to join us uh, to share his thoughts about film festivals in general and about the Dublin International Film Festival in particular. It's my very great pleasure and honour to say hello to Colin Farrell. Hey, Colin, how are you doing? I'm good, Grania. How are you doing? Thanks for the intro. No, I'm delighted. My, so much. I'm delighted to speak to you, love. Yeah, I wish I, I wish I could be home for this. I wish we could all be having a more typical and less special experience through so much of, of what we're doing in our lives. You know, it'd be great to be home, but but fair play to you for putting this on and for allowing people the access to cinema still. You know, it's important, I think, especially yeah. now, perhaps. No, I think you're absolutely right. And I think there's something really interesting, actually, about the move to online. You know, it seems to give great potential for new audiences and, and you know, potentially people who may have not felt the festival was for them. Have you totally. Been I mean, they, they, you know, there's no way, as we, as we all know, you know, um, living virtually is now become such an important staple of our shared experience globally and, 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 and locally, wherever we live. Um, it, it, it pales in comparison to the um, immediacy and the intimacy that we feel when, like if you and I were even having this interview in person, I'd prefer to have it in person. I'd prefer to be in the same space. It should be able to give you a handshake or a squeeze if that was okay. And, and, and sit down and have a natter, you know, and share the same air. But, but, it's, but it's, it's brilliant that we have it. It's amazing that we have this. And it's incredible that, look, film festivals are a boutique industry. You know, there's not that many people that get to experience them. Um, locals get to the film festivals in Toronto or in Dublin. Obviously, people from Toronto can have easy access to it, or those from Dublin can have easy access to the Dublin International Film Festival. But, you know, it's, 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 they are things that are usually... Um, outside of the industry people that come into a city to avail of what the film festival provides, it usually is just local people that go to it, you know. Every now and then you'll get some real cinephiles that aren't being paid to go but will fly in as fans. But what this does virtually is, of course, as you said, it opens it up to a greater uh, panoply of people and a, and a wider audience and allows people to get a sense of of the kind of opportunities and the kind of films that are on display during a festival and the passion that really fuels every film festival. You know, yeah. for every film festival, there's a, there's a Gráinne Humphreys or a Michael Dwyer, you know, Lord rest him. Um, you know, there are people behind the scenes who work the whole year to make this three days, one week, two weeks, whatever the festival duration is to make it possible. And it's so much work and it's so much organization. Um, but they're incredible experiences. Film festivals are so much fun. And I've never went to one just as a fan and I've always been Did threatened to. I've always been, no, and I've always been threatened to. It's one of those pipe dreams, you know, where I go, oh, I have to one day and I never have. Um, because the energy in, during film festivals and, and when I think back to my time, what I can remember of the Dublin International Film Festivals <laughs> through the years, uh, might have to point the finger at a few blackouts had, but, um, they're just incredibly excitement, exciting times. You know, they're just the energy. Everyone is there and it's a, it's a shared journey of discovery. That's no, what I want to, I want to throw a couple of film titles at yeah. you because I remember my first Colin Farrell film, but I don't know if you were there. Were you, were you in the screen for Drinking Crude? I was, yeah. Yeah. I was, yeah. I actually remember that one very vividly. That, that Owen McPolin wrote and directed. Owen, who's, who's obviously, as you know now, you know, still working away as a, as a cinematographer and, and has an amazing career. Um, I haven't crossed paths with him since then. And that was, Jesus, no, what was that? Was 24. So it was 97, Colin. Yeah, it was 24 years. My maths was better than I thought, disappointingly. 24 years ago, Jesus. So I haven't met Owen, oh, but I do remember that night very well. And I remember Andrew and I remember Eva. <laughs> and what was that about? Come here. Oh, oh. Come here, come here. Luna's dog, Luna. who was asleep on a couch when this, this interview started. This is Luna. Luna, come here. Luna, I'd stand up only to see him wearing boxers. I'd go and get her <laughs> otherwise. Luna. Oh. Um, I'll be in a sec, guys, just on an interview. Hey, Jimbo. Hey, son, I'll be in a sec. Um, so what were we saying? Yeah, 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 I do remember that. And I remember that as well because that was where I met Lisa Cook. 
at the screen. Oh, wow. The screen was behind Pear Street. It was Pear Street, wasn't it? That yeah, old cinema it's not there anymore. Yeah, no, I know, I know. I ruined the day that that was, that that was closed down. That was a great cinema. Yeah. Um, and I remember having a great night and that was, I met Lisa Cook uh, from the Lisa Richards agency that night and she yeah, said, yeah. you want to have a chat or whatever. And, um, and that led to other things. Yeah, so that was a very important night for me. And Drinking Crude was the first film that I got to do and the first time I got to work with a bunch of actors on a film. So yeah, the Dublin Film Festival has really that represented was... for me. Abs- it's an absolute origin story for me. Yeah, because it's funny, we worked it out. Well, I worked it out that you've sh- we've shown 10 of your films and you've been here for five of them. And the next one was one that I've talked to about four people since I said that I was going to talk to you. And they went, I remember that screening. It was Tigerland in Cineworld. Do you remember that? It was Tigerland. 2001. So it's 20 years ago. It was in Cineworld, which is in Parnell Street. And it blew yeah. the roof off the actual screening. There was this incredible q and I remember Michael. Michael Dwyer. Yeah. I remember lovely Michael Dwyer, who had such a passion for cinema and obviously was, you know, one of the great founders, if not the, the, the total foundation for what has become the Dublin International Film Festival. Um, I remember talking to Michael and I remember Michael being really gracious with me and very kind and, and feeling almost, um, I, there was a sense of shared excitement. Yeah. And I always felt that, to be honest with you. I don't mean to try and play the, the nationalistic card, but I always felt that. I always felt when I went away that I was representing Ireland in some way. I mean, I wasn't wearing the jersey and stuff and there wasn't a competition, but um, I always felt people were always really decent with me when I got home. Like they really were. And I expected a couple of, I've said this before, I expected a couple of slaps or a couple of digs at some stage in a pub, some night, and someone just wanted to get one over on me. But everyone was always very decent. And I always felt felt that there was a little bit of pride or something. and I and that felt and Mike, I felt that off Michael, and I felt that that yeah. night there was everyone was really cel- it was celebratory, celebratory that that a kid and it could have been anyone, like it could have been it just happened to be me for a number of reasons, many of which I know for a factor outside of my control, but it happened to be you know a Dublin kid came back from having a bit of success yeah. in America, and there was a big yeah. celebration, and it felt really good Huge to be at the centre. Celebration. It felt re- it really was lovely. It was a lovely, a lovely welcome. Yeah. And at that stage, I wasn't. I didn't know where I was living at that stage, Gwanya. So I was, I was living, I was spending a lot of time away from home. I was missing a lot of home. I was more homesick, I think, than I realized or I wanted to fess up to because I was living this dream and I was having all these adventures. So I was keenly aware that I had to be grateful for that. But anytime I got home, I, I, I experienced such sustenance. And that's what basically the Dublin International Film Festival offered me back then was a great kind of anchor to come home and to be able to meld what my life was becoming, which was a life working in film and also a life that had been lived for 20 years in a person's place of birth. So so there was the profundity of being from the place and there was the newness and the exoticism of bringing in this idea of a journey through film or the beginning of a journey in film. I mean, I didn't know if I was ever going to do another film again, so I was definitely going to enjoy it that first time out, you know? Yeah, I mean, because the interesting thing about Tigerland is that that was 2001. And I think it was two years later that Michael kind of relaunched the festival. And you were back, I think, with the only kind of double header because you were with Phone Booth and The Recruit. Remember that? And it was like. Yeah, yeah, I do. I do. Yeah, I do remember that. I remember that. Now, I think that one was a bit more debaucherous. So I I think I might remember less of it. but the I crowds, truly do remember. But the crowds were, were they? There were I mean, huge that's... crowds, yeah. And with lovely photos of you doing the autographs because you were always really connected to the people who were like coming along, you'd chat away to them, they'd all know you. Do you know what I mean? It was that lovely kind Yeah, of, no, it felt you know, nice, man. Mom, that much I know. And sister and the brother. You yeah, know? and it was always a big, we always, it was always a big family affair. And like even the, the premieres we had in, um, in Los Angeles, like back in the day, for the recruit and for I think SWAT and something else maybe fun with I don't know but there were a few of the premieres back in the day in Los Angeles I, I had a bunch of the family come over you know I, I could fly the family over at that point and I mean I had like 20 or 30 family and friends you know rallies and stuff uncles and aunties and That's nephews fantastic. and friends no Grony it was amazing and I think I just did yeah Anyway, it was it was amazing, and it just meant that it wasn't 
we could all share in it, you know, because it, it, I, I didn't want it to, I truly didn't want it to be about me. And I mean, don't get me wrong, I have a big ego and there's plenty of stuff in life I want to be about me. Don't get me wrong. But I, that was too big for it to be. I think that was probably too big for it to be about me. And so I wanted what I did by bringing my family over to Los Angeles for the premieres, that was just offered up to me on a platter when the Dublin yeah. Film Festival was on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It, was be, it was almost because an LA premiere wasn't the Dublin Film Festival that I had to it. fly everyone. You know, yeah, of course, you know. What's that say? I just have problems being alone. But um, but no, the, 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 yeah, Dublin's always, the Film Festival has always been an amazing time for me. And I, I again, Michael Dwyer, I was so sad the day that he that he died yeah. and he was taken. Well, unfortunately, your time is your time, but he was taken way before what I had wished his time would have been. You know, he was such a such a purist and a lover of cinema and of the kind of, of the of the collective, the collective energy of cinema as well, which, again, is what, you know, some cinema, uh, you know, whether you experience whether you're one person on your own in a dark room or whether you're sharing it with 300 film is film. But there is something beautiful. And I go to the cinema you know to the theater on my own in the afternoon sometimes and i love it but there's something so beautiful about the the communal element and dynamic of sharing film with with other people and that's never more exemplified than it is during a film festival i yeah. find no I, no I absolutely agree i remember i remember going to toronto with him and he had this great fight so he still got really excited when the lights went down totally. there was huge potential yeah, totally yeah you know? totally yeah and he, yeah all and you were seeing it before everyone else, you know, yeah. that, that was that excitement as well, you know, these were all, and, and, and by and large, there is an air of, of optimism, an air of positivity, an air of hope. Anyone that goes to a film festival, they really want the films to be great. Like they're, they're, they're invested, yeah. they're physically by their presence, they're, psychologically and emotionally by their in, uh, attention and their hope, they're invested in the films working, in the filmmakers having a good time, in the actors realizing characters in a strong and clear and moving way, you know? So to be around again, that degree of focused positivity and optimism, and it's not, you know, it's not foolish, it's not wishy-washy, it's very active and it's very engaged is a, is a really lovely thing, a really powerful thing. But I want, I want to bring you to, to one film that I have very special connection to, which is my first year and as festival director, I was desperate to find the perfect opening night film. And I couldn't work out. It was the first time I was going to be programming the big Savoy space, you know? And then I saw In Bruges and I just thought, yes, it's here. We've oh, got nice. it, fantastic. Nice. And I, I remember so clearly there was yourself and Brendan and Martin and Clemence were all there. Yeah. It, rocked it was that was, a, that was an amazing night that was an amazing night again that was you know because that was i mean you know you'd be lying if you said there wasn't a, 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 a distinct or if i said there wasn't a distinct form of national pride um anytime you get to do anything in the name of our island and and to have martin you know having written and directed this piece and to have me and brendan who was you know at the time and remains of course one of my favorite actors and, and favorite human beings basically um but to be able to have that experience with them lads and then bring it home and clemence to come over and you know it was it was very special it was a very special experience shooting the film it's very special script you know the whole thing was very it just and it felt like there was a harmony it felt like it was supposed to yeah. get its its debut and its screening at the Dublin International Film yeah. Festival, it really did. Um, yeah, that was a glorious time. And that was me first, you know, it was great because that was as well, that my life was very different, you know, by the time yeah. In Bruges came out, by the time we shot In Bruges, you know, it was one of the, it was one of the first films I did. I think it was the second or third film I did sober. You know, so it was, and I think it was the first film festival I had attended sober. And let me tell you, after 15 or 20 years of, of carousing the way I, you know, drink the way I drink, the sober world is a pretty scary world, you know, yeah, can be. Yeah, yeah. And, and genuinely, so to come home and to do it sober and, and not have the buffer, not have the support of a few drinks just to calm the nerves. Yeah. Um, you know, it was an, it was a really amazing thing. And I remember being more nervous. I remember being more uncomfortable initially at that film festival than any others because I didn't have any booze in me, basically, obviously. Um, 
But the, as so often happens, the flip side of that was having gotten through the initial discomfort and the initial self judgments or whatever tensions were created inside me, um, having gotten through those initially, it was easily the most rewarding film festival that yeah, I had in Dublin. Yeah. Easily, easily the most rewarding experience and the most memorable and the one I could remember most. Yeah, it's funny because I want to ask you a question about audiences because I've yeah. seen that film. I went on a mad tour after that fe um, festival. I went to loads of other festivals and I ended up watching in Bruges in lots of different places. Oh, you did? Yeah. Well, and you tell me, what was that like? Well, I saw it in Budapest and it was just hilarious because they, they, they started laughing really, really quickly. Ah, and they missed... And and I kind of get this sense, you know how Toronto audiences are also very different. They've got a mm -hmm. kind of different texture to it. But yeah. for you, because you're obviously literally watching them, trying to spot if they get the nuances of things that right. you're doing. What, what, is, what is the difference between, an, you know, Dublin or an Irish audience and an international audience for some, some of your films? I mean, I've only, um, I've only experienced, it's funny, I've only experienced the audiences uh, during films that I've been in. And so I am so uncomfortable during, yeah. you know, before, during and after. I mean, I re after is where I'm at most relieved because the press has been done, the film's been seen and what have you. Um, so it's hard for me to have a, that level of objectivity. What I will say is of course, um, uh, in in Cannes, if I remember correctly, you, you can you can sense a kind of a a more um, a kind of a sense of a highbrow discernment in Cannes. You know, you can kind of when I said everyone there is a fan. Remember, I said a few minutes ago, yeah. people go to film festivals. They're all fans. They're all hoping that the film works. Yeah. If there's one film festival that mightn't be that apparent, it's it's perhaps Cannes. And I have loved my time at Cannes. Yeah. And if anyone from Cannes sees this, I'm not speaking ill about you. Relax, relax. I'm just saying, you know, the audience are, are a little bit harsher there. Toronto, they're incredibly supportive. They are. I mean, the Canadian yeah. people as a whole are incredibly warm and supportive and, and they just want what's best for everyone. Um, and in during In Bruges, what I remember that year was laughter. Yes. I had never done yeah. a film. I had never done a film and never been to a premiere where there was so much laughter. I and I just remember the kind of sense of bomb or elixir that again communal laughter can can leave you with you know that yeah. sense of healing you know yeah. to share laughter and to share in the gaiety of a moment with a bunch of people and and to be a part of eliciting that laughter oh my god I was high as a kite yeah on, on my most sober year I was, I was high as a kite I really was one. it really was it was amazing I had never and I remember sitting there and, and thinking, holy shit, is this what comedians, those who do comedies, yeah. Yeah. live with? You know, and of course, it's, of course, it's, as we know, knowing a little bit about the lives of comedians, you know, it's not that simple. Of course, it can be quite, quite counterintuitive where that all comes from and, and what it leaves one with after performance. But I just thought it was, a, it was a really lovely thing. And the audience, I did get what we've spoken about already at nauseum, which was the sense of pride that the audience had in, yeah. in Martin and in Brendan and in me and, and, and me and them. And it was just, it was a, it was a really, really uh, spectacularly um, beautiful evening. And it's really interesting because, you know, charging back to some of the other films that we've shown and some, some of you've been here for like Ondine, which was another, you know, great opening night. And a film yeah. that we showed last year, which was Street Leagues, which is a yes. wonderful documentary um, about, you know, that the... Um, yeah, about World the Homeless World Cup. Yeah. Brilliant. But, it, you know, what's lovely is, is, is festivals kind of embrace, you know, films that are coming out. They're kind of big films, small films. Um, totally. And for Street Leagues, there was a great chance to see, you know, a, a, a kind of a, an Irish story, but told brilliantly. I mean, those two guys are fantastic. Yeah, they're fantastic. And it was obviously, I mean, you get involved in something like documenting the street leagues and, and, and the players, the athletes and the organisers of that league. You're not doing it for money. Do you yeah. know what I mean? You're doing it truly. I mean, there's just no argument. You're doing it because you have a passion and you you want to advocate for, for some kind of... Um, change some kind of change in community change in legislation change in a shift in perspective yeah. you know so i was i was delighted and humbled to be able to be part of that and to be able to be in in any small way part of the 
the homeless World Cup, you know, the street leagues through the years. But that's what, again, what your festival and what, what all festivals offer the opportunity for is for young voices and, and first time filmmakers as well to have an arena whereby they can they can put their work out there so that they can be seen by other filmmakers. They can be seen by studios as well. They can be bought, purchased by, you know, people who are willing to distribute their work to a, a, a broader audience and that they can be seen as well by the cinema going audience, you know. Yeah, it's important. I mean, Sundance, obviously, you know, and then there's the the, the parallel uh, institutions that can be created, like the Sundance Lab. You know, yeah. I mean, I was I did the Sundance Lab with, I think, with Peter McDonald. Uh, I don't even know if it was before or after Drinking Crude, but I remember being down in Ballinasloe. I think it was in Ballinasloe doing um, a few nights at the Sundance Lab. You know, and it was just a bunch of actors staying in a cottage and and getting up with a little a little handy cam on tripods and, and working out a scene and it was gloriously no frills and we were just in there trying to figure out all of us what we were doing the filmmaker the writer the actors and and it was extraordinary and that was all by virtue of Sundance which was of course the brainchild of Robert Redford and and is essentially a film festival you know yeah, absolutely. And, and it has created so many careers, you know, I mean, yeah. in that way. I mean, it is literally, you know, like a, a launch pad or, a, you know, a kind yeah. of a, la a, a laboratory of talent, you know? Yes, totally. Yeah. And um, one thing I wanted just to, to, to kind of ask you about, I suppose, is, is ha have you a chance or had a chance to see this year's program or anything that you're kind of. Just I'm excited to, to see. Um, I'm excited to see uh, Jervis film uh, Ammonite. Wow, what yeah. You yeah, yeah, I'm a nice. Yeah, I'm a nice. Yeah, I'm excited to see that. I just love her. Really. That just, she's just extraordinary. And and um and I'm excited. I really want to see Supernova. It looks beautiful. Yeah, it's really he's that filmmaker Harry McQueen. Yeah, he's really, really exciting. I think he's got it, a beautiful eye and this. It looks very beautiful. How are you doing it, Gronya? How are you doing the screenings and stuff? How's it going? All by Eventive. So it's on a it's on an online platform. So we dropped by about 50% down to about 65 films. Um, not bad, not bad. Sports. Yeah, not bad. Not bad, so we've love. Got a, we've got a retro um, and we've got loads of features. We've got fantastic films from places like Korea and Mexico and Brilliant. lots of new Irish work, fantastic documentaries. Um, and actually, we have a project that's coming to LA, but you're going to have gone. So I'll try and get it to uh, to Australia, which is a music video project called Playback that Erica mm. Cody and Mike Donnelly have curated. Brilliant hip hop music videos being made in Ireland, and we're going to tour it. Can you can you send me anything? Or, I mean, I'd love to just be able to yeah. check in anyway. No, yeah. absolutely, I will. I will in an absolute heartbeat. So yeah. listen, Colin, I'm conscious of your time, and uh, there's a couple of oh, questions, good. kind of. Yeah, go on. at the end so um this one is um when did you first fall in love with the cinema uh first of all in love with the cinema well I, I grew up on a, a lot of staples of commercial american cinema like you know the indiana joneses and back to the futures and jaws and um great films that stand the test of time all of them as far as i'm concerned but i think i had a i had a, a girlfriend once upon a time a long time ago through the mists of and uh she showed me paris texas and paris texas was kind of a turning point for me you know it was it, it was the first time that i i it was the first time i can remember i mean when i saw et when i was a kid in the cinema in the savoy on O'Connor street with my uncle tommy i remember bawling crying so don't get me wrong et did reach into my heart and slap it about for a bit but as a young man the first time as a kind of a version or prototype of an adult the first time I remember a film really getting into my psyche really getting into my mind and really getting into my heart and 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 almost terrifying me with its representation of loneliness and loss which are two very serious themes that we all have to contend with at certain stages in our lives but that first time was Vim Vendor's Paris Texas you know and and to this day it's it's still one of my favorite top five films and just one of the most moving cinema experiences that I've ever had still and I've never seen it on a big screen I look forward to hopefully someday seeing it on a big screen All right. there'll, there'll be a rerun or something like that um but yeah and just the script and still to this day the 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 most beautifully written and beautifully performed monologue that I've ever seen in cinema you know when he when Harry Dean Stanton Travis turns the 
I mean, just that gesture when he it, when I saw it the first time when he turned the seat around because he couldn't look at her. It was too much to look at her. And if he was going to recount what he knew of their shared time together, he had to go inside. So he turned the chair around and sat while she was the other side of the glass screen. I mean, I'll never forget it. I knew these two people, these people once, these two people. So that was the first, the first, uh, that was kind of the thing that, yeah. That is a good, that is best answer I've heard. Well, that was the one, you know, as I said, there was so many other things before that were so, and and I still go back to entertainment and I, you know, cinema and film as pure entertainment and as pure diversion, it it also plays a great part of my life, but as provocation and as, as a a kind of tender reflection of the struggles of what it is to be a human being. Paris, Texas gets the gold medal. Inventor Sam Shepard. There you go. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Dream team. Yeah. And the, Part you wished you'd played? Uh, Tootsie. <laughs> <laughs> Tootsie, yeah. Tootsie. 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 Tootsie, also one of my favorite films. And just, you know, I mean, I th- yeah, it'd be, you know, tricky now, of course, but I think because of exactly how that character is structured and that story is structured, I think maybe uh, possibly, um, uh, you'd be able to do it. I don't know. But anyway, that one, I just love that film. And I just, yeah. that, that role in Dustin Hoffman is just perfect in it. And then everyone, everyone in it again is, you know, Sidney Pollack at his best and, and Charles, Dern, Charles Durning and Jessica Lang and Bill Murray. And um, yeah, it's a brilliant cast. Brilliant cast and perfect film. But yeah, that would have been, that one would have been fun. And he's great. He's so, unla- like, he's such an asshole, you know, uh, oh. Dorsey. He's, he's such an asshole at the start. I mean, he's so unlikable. He's kind of one of those that's likable because he's so unlikable. He's so egocentric and, and he's brilliant. Dustin is so brilliant and he doesn't shy away from that at all. He laps it up. And then by the end, you know, when he's in the bar and he's broken down and he, and he comes to give the ring back to, <laughs> to Charles Durning and Charles Durning doesn't even look at him, goes outside, give it to me outside, you know, because he wants to slap the head off him. Um, but anyway, yeah, Tootsie would Tootsie be my answer. Fantastic. And then the final one is what's the favorite part that you've played yourself? Oh boy. Uh, oh man. God, there's such a, I could go to tag and bore and I could, if there's anyone still awake, I could have them asleep in 30 seconds with the, the beginning of what would be a very long winded answer to this one because they all just mean different things at different times. And, um, but I, I was supposed to the obvious answer and the obvious because it's true is, is, uh, is on Dean. And because that experience was very special because I still, you know, as I said, there's a, there's a, a magic yeah. little, 11 year old, little 11 year old upstairs now who's doing his homeschooling and, and he's only yeah. there by virtue of that film. And, and that character of Syracuse um, and that story and, and working with Neil um, and being shooting in one of my favorite parts of the world. Yeah. Hands down, if not my favorite, to be honest with you, part of the world, the Bear Peninsula and Castletown Bear. And that's where I did Falling for a Dancer for the BBC was my first professional yeah. job. So to go back to, uh, to go back to Castletown Bear, uh, you know, 15 years later and do on Dean with Neil was extraordinary and with Alicia. So I think that character, yeah, I'll say that character. That was a great choice. No, I, I well remember it actually, because uh, I remember you had got a very new baby when you were in Dublin for that, for yeah. that screening and you were feeling the new babies kind of just changing your tongue. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, he's not a new baby anymore. Doing his things, <laughs> doing good. They're both good, both good lads. Colin, thank you so, so much. You've been thanks a million, Grana, for taking the time. Generous with your time. So thanks a million. Not at all. It's a pleasure talking to you, love.